If you joined us yesterday, thank you for coming and joining us again. If this is your first lecture, um, welcome. I'd like to introduce to you all Dr. Brian Dewsbury, our store lecturer for the week. Um, a little bit about him. He is the principal investigator of the Science Education and Society, also known as C's Research Program, where he and his team explore questions pertaining to the social context of education. He is a fellow with the John N. Gardner Institute in the Rios Institute, where he assists institutions of higher education in transforming their practices toward equity-mindedness. He's also joined us as um, the keynote speaker for the SOTO presentation back in 2020. So with no further waiting, Dr. Brian Dewsbury. Nora, Nora, come let me in. The doors are fastened and the windows pinned. Keep your hands on that plow and hold on. Nora said you done lost your track. Can't keep plowing and looking back. Keep your hand on that plow and hold on. Hold on, hold on. Keep your hand on that plow and hold on. I had to find a different way to tell you this story. I have to find a different way to convey this message because I know you're used to me going places and, and putting the graphs up and, and putting the, the labels and, and the models and the p-values. I, I know I'm a professor. I know I have to do that. But deep in my heart, I'm from West Africa. I come from the griot tradition of storytelling of narratives, of humanity and soul. So when I, when I tell you this story, I want to tell it to you in a way that you not only understand why the journey through science is a beautiful one, but what it entails. And I have to tell you this story in a different way because I, I care so much that you get this. I have to be able to tell it to you in different kinds of strategies. I have to tell you that this is a beautiful story. And it's, it was made beautiful because so much struggle happened before the beauty came. I have to tell you that part of this story is about luck. Part of the story is, is, is being in situations where the, the privilege of, of having people who can support you, who can believe in you, who, who do things for you without even knowing how those things are meaningful, just being present. So there's no one way I can tell this story, and it has to be my story because your story might be different. So, so I have to tell you a story about holding on. And that story is not one of sadness. And it's not always one of joy. But it's certainly one that ended in a place that I, that I wish for you. I have to tell you about this young man who had here at one time in his life. Boy, were those 20 glorious years. <laughs> you know, I have to tell you that, you know, he was born in an island that, that is, is, is small, but it doesn't feel small when you're there, right? It's, it's, it's large and it's beautiful, and you see the ocean every time you get up, and, and when the day is clear, you see Venezuela off in the distance. And if you're trying to get there, you go all the way down the Caribbean, island after island after island. No, my accent's not from Jamaica. It's a different country. Trinidad is a different country. 
It's the last island in the archipelago, so if you get to Venezuela, you've gone too far. And it's called Trinidad because a man called Christopher Columbus was, was sailing west. And before he got to America in 1492, he was coming from the south of the island and he saw three mountains to the southwest that reminded him of the Father and Son and the Holy Spirit. The Blessed Trinity. And so he called this country Trinidad. I have to tell you the story of the people that were brought to Trinidad. After the people who were there were mostly exterminated. I have to tell you that these, these people had a beautiful history. And a violent history and a sad history. Because at that time, before Western Europe drew their lines around Africa, they were in tribes and kingdoms, and they would fight and they would go to war with each other. And the result of that war was capture. So when the British showed up, they said, we'll give you guns, we'll give you weapons in exchange for slaves. So if you were a Fanti or a Shanti and you were captured by somebody else, you were blindfolded and walked dozens of miles through the swamps of what is now Ghana. And when the blindfolds were removed, you opened your eyes to a dungeon filled with about 50 or 60 people who looked and smelled just like you in a room that was probably built to hold about 10. And you would look up and you would see a small, I guess I can't call it a window, but it was a space with a little bit of light. And then to the bottom of the door was a, another small opening through which Scraps of food would be, would be passed to you. I have to tell you about the channel, right? Not, not the boating channel. The channel where, when you were about to be sold to slavery, there was a narrow passageway that was so narrow, you could only actually walk one at a time in single file to the edge of the castle. I want to tell you about the Methodist church that is built as part of that castle with an opening to that same dungeon, the one I just told you about, right? The same opening. So that on Sunday morning service, somebody would stand guard at that opening while service is happening to ensure that the slaves are all right. I want to tell you about the door of no return. That once you walk through that channel and through that door, you never returned to the continent. And that process of you walking through that door was single-handedly responsible for the African diaspora in the Western Hemisphere. I want to tell you that they had to do it about six or seven at a time. Because you see, the coast in what's now Ghana is actually very shallow for a few miles out. So you couldn't bring the slave ships close to shore. You had to use smaller boats and row them out seven at a time. I have to tell you that most of the slaves that were taken from Africa actually went to the Caribbean and South America including your ancestors. And the experiences were somewhat different and somewhat similar, depending on which country you were in. And some of your ancestors, some of our ancestors, went to Barbados. 
And the thing about slavery was, it wasn't just about the labor. It was about the removal of identity. And one of the ways in which that was done was the separation of families, yes, but also the provision of a name by your slave masters. Did you really think my ancestors came from England? Why do you think we are called Dewsbury? Burr means land. Dews was a family name. In England, that meant land owned by Dews. So I want to tell you about that family in a place called Dewsbury in England who found Jesus. And, and freed their slaves before emancipation occurred. And several years after, probably around the early 1900s, two brothers who were descendants of that family went to a place called Trinidad. One of them left almost immediately and went to New York. And one stayed. And his great grandson was this person, my father. And that remained a really small family in Trinidad. And I think I want to tell you because knowing a history gives you a sense of, of meaning. Right For a people whose history has been cut off and, and separated and questioned, and you, you have to fight for your identity in any space, whether it's a country, a classroom, or a campus, knowing these things gives you a strange sense of power. So as I buried him on New Year's Eve of 2021, I remember that history. And I remember that that. As somebody who was one of 15 children, who was homeless, who, who at sometimes had to beg on the streets for food, invested in a family because he would say, there has to be something better than this. There has to be something better than this. I have to tell you about Caribbean parents. They're a strange bunch, aren't they? They're great. They're great. Like you, you grow up and you know, you, you, if you do migrate and you end up in new countries like America, Canada, Europe, I know Europe's not a country. Stay with me. You learn terms that you didn't know was a term, right? <laughs> Organic farming, we just call that food. <laughs> Middle class, upper class, you got up, you ate, you went to school. But one of the things, you know, you, you, you get to appreciate later in life is, is when you, you have parents who are so driven for you to be that, to take that next step forward. It's almost the single goal of a first generation parent. That whatever you do has to be just slightly better than what I was able to accomplish. Not in a self-deprecating way, but that's just how it works. And I have to tell you that I only really understood that when I got to a point in my life where I had the privilege to teach first generation students like myself. I didn't understand that, right? I, I was just, you know, running around the island, I love water, I love farming, I love the environment. I was, when I came here, I learned apparently I was a tree hugger. I didn't know that, I just liked what I liked. And I felt, well, my dreams at that time maybe was a little bit too big for where I was, right? So I have to, I have to get on that plane, I have to go to Atlanta, Georgia, and I have to, I have to do something else. And I have to say I was lucky because I had parents who encouraged that. 
who, who, who saw something and said, you know, what you want out of this world, we can't provide it for you here. So you, you need to go. And you need to be okay with that. I have to tell you, you know, it, it, gets, it gets tricky with parents who didn't go to college. Because the way the calculus works is just get there. Just get there. We, we, we don't know like, what credit hours look like and what you know, course plans and degree services and career office. Just get to college. Something will work out. Just get there. So I got there. I got there with a four-year full scholarship ride. And I would, and I would tell, you know, I, you know, so I, you know, Morehouse College, wonderful school. And when I get here, I would tell my cousins who live in Philly, they're American, and I would tell friends, oh yeah, I'm at Morehouse College, and I say, oh, did you, did you go there for the black experience? Nah, I went because it was free. Like, what are you all talking about? <laughs> we, we, we international, man. It's a six to one exchange rate. Either it, I'm funded or I don't come. That's, that's it. And I have to tell you how much later in life I had to learn how privileged I was to essentially be there at no cost. And how, how much later in life I learned how few people are able to walk away with a degree and no debt. Especially when I couldn't afford a dime of it. Right? I have to tell you about the times when the, the, the bank account was, was $19.25. But Bank of America would only allow you to withdraw in multiples of 20. So you effectively had no money. Or when you had $23.61, but as a $4 charge to use a different ATM plus the charge of yours, so again, you actually have no money. And how confusing that was to me. <laughs> and I had to tell you that when I would call my mom, which I did often, with a phone card that was supposed to give me 21 minutes, but it would charge a tax, so even, you actually got like 15 minutes. And don't you dare use that phone card more than once, because then it's really like two minutes. And she would say, look, at the end of the day, you have a Bible and a meal plan. Good luck. And I have to tell you that they came with me and stayed with me for orientation week. And again, I would find out later that this is something first generation parents do. And our lovely provost would stand, you know, Morehouse is all male identifying students, right? And so the provost stands, all these men at this school where Martin Luther King went and Samuel Jackson went and Spike Lee went and just so many alumni and they just be in this presence, right? And he would say to the parents, you can go. Your kids, your children are now ours. And my dad said, but we booked a whole week in the Holiday Inn. I don't think that's an option. <laughs> We're here for the week. <laughs> and at the end of this week, we sat in this bench, which is in the middle of Morehouse's campus. And it's still there. And they said to me, looked me dead in the eye and said, I've taken you as far as I can. I've taken you as far as I can. Good luck. And I have to tell you, I, I look back at my dad, I look at the tears in his eyes, and I didn't get it. I didn't get it. I didn't get what that meant. I didn't, I didn't understand. As 19, I didn't understand what it means to watch a child grow up and be in that moment. I didn't understand what it meant to live the life he did. 
and, and manage something middle class and, and just get them to that spot. I didn't understand what that term first generation meant. It's not just for the student, it's for everybody involved. So I got up and I walked away and I bade goodbye. And I carried on. I carried on. I got into my science classes. I was, I was riding on the laurels of, of secondary school because in Trinidad, you follow the British system. So the last two years of high school is essentially the first two years of college. So at first, everything seems to come easy until you get to physics, until I got to organic chem and Calc 2, all in the same semester. And I remember seeing the grades come back and being in classrooms where you had three chances to show how much you knew stuff. Every four weeks, like clockwork, how much did you memorize? I remember the professor who said at the start of class, 90% of you all will fail this. And I remember he was right. And he said it as a point of pride. I remember they told us, look to your left, look to your right. <laughs> One of you all will not be here. And they were also right. And I remember thinking, like, that can't be me. <laughs> right? Like, I came here on a full ride. But I remember that semester... As the B minuses turned to C's, and the understanding just wasn't coming, and the time seemed to evaporate, and the help just didn't seem to be there, and I didn't know how to ask for help, or who to ask, or what kind of question to ask, or even know that I, I was supposed to ask a question in a particular way, at a particular time, or that tutoring wasn't just for people who... who didn't think they were suddenly not smart enough. It was for everybody. And then by the time you realize that all the time has passed, and now you're looking at one more exam. And I remember sitting in my college bedroom with that twin bed where my legs would hang off because it's so tiny. And doing the math of what my cumulative GPA would be if I got the grades that I was destined to get based on my performance up until that moment. I remember Calc 2 and, and, and math in general being a real challenge. But suddenly, I became the world's best mathematician when it came time to figuring that stuff out. And when you did the division and you added up and you figured out the GPA points and you saw that 2.99 number and come up in your calculator screen. And I remember as vividly as it was yesterday, my body convulsing involuntarily, literally shaking as if I was outside in New England winter, thinking about having to call my mother and say, I didn't get it done. All those years, all that sacrifice, all those lessons, all that belief, all those hopes and dreams and the tears at the end of orientation week, it just, it just couldn't happen. And I'll tell you, I don't, I don't believe in curving. Just not my thing, you know. I just really want those grades to reflect the learning that I think or hope happened. I will tell you, though, thank God that physics teacher curved that class. That C plus was probably a D, easy. And the way the scholarship thing works is, once you lose it, you don't get it back. Like, you don't get, like, you come back to the next. No, no, it's, it's gone. 
3.01. Walked into that, sub, that junior year with 3.01. And I remember I, I, I did call home. And, and you notice I keep saying my mother because talking to my dad about this was out of the question. That was a hard stop. And I remember explaining a little bit that there were some struggles. I wasn't fully honest about how close we were to the ultimate. But her response was, well, if you can't hack it, you can come home. No, but she didn't ask me about my study strategies. She didn't ask me if I was a metacognitive student. <laughs> she didn't ask me if I went to see the professor to discuss my struggles. And that's when I got it. When they said, I've taken you as far as I can, that meant they had no more capital to offer me after that moment, other than their love. And so I remember when the professor who became my undergraduate mentor took me aside and didn't ask me why I wasn't studying hard enough. He didn't ask me what's wrong with me. He didn't ask me, you know, why aren't you paying more attention to your classes? He said, Brian, when you look at the world around you and you see yourself in 10, 15, 20 years from now, in what ways are you helping humanity? In what ways are you contributing to the common good and social justice? Like, how, what's your future self? What are you working towards? Or are you just here to take classes? And I remember, it was the first time in the six semesters, sorry, four semesters I was there, that somebody appear to take an interest in me. Not my GPA, not my transcript, but in me. It was the first time I ever felt that I was being taught and it wasn't even in a classroom. And we talked about, so this is still Tree Hugger Brian, right? We talked about you know, environmental stuff, and, and, and he helped me start a club. We started an environmental club, and I would do stuff with Nature Conservancy, and I worked in his lab and studied these little silly sailfin molly fish that annoyed me, but whatever. You know, like you, you're doing stuff. Like, it's as if college began on the first day of my junior year. I have to tell you the story this way because... Sometimes in life, lessons are being taught to you even when you aren't ready to hear and understand the lesson. And when you, if you have the, the privilege to get to a later point in your life, it behooves you to reflect on the moments when those lessons are being taught and reinterpret their value to your present. I have to tell you that I... I I went to a, a historically black college in a city that was mostly African American. And up until that point, that's how my American experience was defined. So I have to tell you that because I have this naive Caribbean upbringing where I didn't have to think of issues of class in the same way or at the same level, I actually just wasn't used to racism. It's a very strange thing to say, but that was the actual truth. So when I became a grad student in ecology, it was probably the first time I engaged with white America in large quantities, constantly. So I wasn't always prepared for some of the things that would happen, right? And I, I struggle telling these stories because I, I, I worry that sometimes people will hear it and say, you know, man, should have taught that person a lesson. But you know, you're just wired a little bit differently when your life history is also different. 
right? So I go to Ecological Society of America, 5,000 person conference, right? Grad student doing a bunch of really cool marine stuff. I have my little sea grasses with nitrogen and phosphorus in it. I'm going to present because they apparently grow faster with one nutrient versus the other. So I'm there in like a shirt and tie and a conference badge, poster session, right? I say I'll get myself a little bit of coffee before I stand there for two meaningless hours. And so I'm getting this coffee and lovely gentleman, white identified, walks up to me and says, can you ask your manager to bring some more milk? It always takes me 10 seconds to figure out what just happened. Because my first go-to is, why do you think I have a manager? And then I have to process, oh, the convention staff are mostly black, and so you assume, even though I'm wearing a badge that clearly says my name, that I'm what? And then now your next step is a decision, right? Do you turn this into a thing? Do you run up on them and confirm another bias? Do you use this as an education moment? Am I now to have a sophisticated conversation with you about implicit bias? And hand you a couple of peer-reviewed papers that shows how it plays out in situations such as this? Am I supposed to walk away from it and ignore it? Or make him feel, who's clearly feeling very badly right now, make him feel better. Because I feel bad now that you feel bad. <laughs> and I have to tell you, what, what really got me was that just 45 minutes ago, at the same meeting, I'm at the, a luncheon a diversity luncheon, where they're celebrating the six black kids they brought to attend the conference. And so I find myself not thinking about him asking me for milk. I'm thinking about, man, do you all not see the disconnect here? So you want to just give out stuff and not look in the mirror? I have to tell you that I attended that conference six years in a row. And that happened in different ways at least three times. And at some point, you get numb to it. At some point, you shouldn't, but you do. Because that's what happens when something happens a few times. You get numb to it. And I have to tell you that in my reflection on this, I realize I have some privilege. Well, I don't know if I'm an optimist, maybe too much of an optimist, right? But I, can, I have some weird ability to kind of step away and process everything I see and, and take this sort of intellectual approach and say, well, in response to that, I'm going to make sure that I help other people understand bias and, and awareness and inclusion in ways that are more sophisticated. It, it almost, I'm giving myself more work because of this BS. And, I'm, and I'm, I'm embracing it. Because I know I have my brothers and sisters out there who, if they go through that stuff one more time, they will in fact run up on somebody. And so I'm thinking about these vexing questions about how do you make these spaces more diverse? How do you create a culture where you show up and you have the privilege to just get excited about the science and nothing else? You don't, you don't feel like the odd person out. There isn't that rising thing in your stomach that tells you you are the scholarship person. You are the travel awardee. Because we need to show that we can help the downtrodden. I, I want to tell you that I consider myself a person of enormous privilege. 
that when they sat me on that bench and they said, we give you as much as we can, part of what they did give me is fierce independence. They didn't say, go be that, go be this. This is the thing that will bring the Dewsbury family prestige. This is the career that you must, if, you know, you must do if college is to be worth it. They said, do the things that align with your values. Whether it's your partner, whether it's your major, whether it's your career choice, whether it's where you live, how you vote, be guided by your values. We know, Brian, you don't go to church anymore. But we do recognize that you're still a person of faith. That you're still somebody who values values. And you will have those values inform the decisions that you make. So, I'm in a grad system that prides itself on being value neutral. That all we do is show up and get numbers and publish papers and, and find out really interesting things. And, to be fair, those things really were interesting. But I also saw the plantation at work. It makes us uncomfortable when things are described in its realistic fashion. But I also saw the plantation at work because there was no model, right? There was no model for we are going to prepare you for a variety of things. So in the absence of that model, every grad student is attempting to be like the person who's paying their salary. If I could just be like my PI, right? If I, if I critique papers the same way they do, if I ask that question in seminar, even though I don't really have a question, but I just have to show you how smart I am, so I have to ask a question. And if my PI is, is like cursing out this person who wrote this paper and I can't believe they use Bayesian methods, so I have to do it too. Because my PI is successful, he's tenured, right? And that apparently is the only way to do this job. So then what comes from that is all these silly things like, I expect you to be in here 90 hours a week. What does the time have to do with anything? If you get the job done in a reasonable time, why are you not taking a break in a weekend? You're a human being. Why are you celebrating burnout? Why are you practicing a life of ignoring your body, your mental health, your loved ones? For the sake of a prize of saying, I spent all my weekend on this grant. Oof, I'm so tired. Should we now congratulate you because your eyes are red on a Monday? You had three nights to, to get good sleep and you couldn't manage that, and now you want an award? But I see the plantation at work because you do get the reward, right? You get the, the hallway comments of, man, I can't believe how, how much he got done over, over the weekend, and you know, he was there weighing samples. Well, he could have done that Wednesday. It gave me a lot. That's a point of privilege. That's not a deficit. So, on campus, the message was, don't waste your time teaching. That's not scholarly work. That's not what you're here for. You're here to publish. You're here to move this lab forward. You're here to advance knowledge. But don't professors also teach? No, 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 but yes, but you, you're here <laughs> to be in this lab as much as you can. All right. But that's the privilege. You see, sometimes you experience things in life after which you can't go back to who you were. And it's a hard thing to explain because unless you had the experience, it's very difficult to articulate to somebody who hasn't gone through that transition. 
But it's a blessed transition. It's a beautiful transition. And it's, it's, that new place you found is, is such a place of power and beauty that you're almost afraid to talk about it because you feel like you might undersell it. That classroom was magic. I was terrible. <laughs> there was no training. Nobody, you know, the, the whole enterprise was set up that whatever letter you got in three months was apparently a reflection of who you were as a person. <laughs> there was no self-reflection. This was not a skill. But I learned in that semester that I took my first foray into the classroom that this is a people business. We like to call it all sorts of things, right? You need, you're, going to get a, you're going to school to get a major in, in biology, in physics, in literature. This is a people business. John Dewey said that education is not a preparation for life. It's, it's life itself. And so the kinds of things you expect from a civically engaged individual as an adult, you should be preparing for that in every classroom. It is not to say that the content doesn't matter. But do you reasonably think that when you go to college, you can be told and cover everything there is to know on any particular topic in a four-year time period? Will we not be doing you that did service if all we did was showed up and gave you stuff? It is 2022. Can that not be outsourced to YouTube? Do you think that because you got a PhD in the left eye of a hedgehog, that you are the only source of information about biology, about chemistry? Like, what do you think the goal of this, this class is? And I want to tell you that these are the questions I had to ask myself because nobody was asking it. And the road to Damascus is, is a road of reflection. It's a road where when that moment happens to you, you not only embrace it and interrogate it, you ask yourself, what's going to change? I want to tell you that as much as I loved marine biology, Education and studying education became a calling. And I want you to understand what a calling is. I want you to understand that, that many people in your life get up and do jobs and do them well. Some even like it. But I want to tell you that a calling is above and beyond that. That it is something you respond to every day. That transcends the paycheck. It transcends the title. But most importantly, it transcends the voices who might seek to negate and push against you when what you do makes them uncomfortable. I want to tell you that we are yet to build a classroom in a, in a space so magical that we haven't fully come to terms with what it is yet, with how beautiful it can be. And to be in a space where you are trying to have this conversation over and over, I want you to understand that that's a revolutionary space. It's a space of constant protest, not, not in a way that's, that's, that should dwarf you or, or make you feel depressed about the enormity of the task. But it, it, it's, 
It's so counter to what people expect that their fear, that their loathing, that their defensiveness is it comes from a place of what you're doing is a threat to my identity. And so because of that, I want you to understand that sometimes people don't know what they don't know. You know, like that time when wonderful colleagues of mine applied to the provost's office for a faculty line because, you know, the provost is a progressive man and he funded a minority faculty fellow, which essentially was a postdoc who would get one year as a postdoc and then migrate to a faculty position. The criteria for the department to get this was the postdoc had to be a person of color. So the department had to apply to the provost's office for this. And I want to tell you about the colleagues who would vote Obama five times if they could. I know because they told me wrote in that proposal that we seek to get a minority faculty fellow to complement our current minority hire, Brian Dewsbury. I want to remind you that I just applied and got the job. I wasn't part of a program. I wasn't, to my knowledge, given special consideration. I assumed, at least up until that point, that I was hired because I just might be good at what I was doing. And I want to tell you that I had to go to a faculty meeting to explain to everyone that when you use that kind of language, notwithstanding you never asked me to put my name in that, but when you use that kind of language, what you are telling me is my value to you in this space, is my physical attributes and not my intelligence. So I want to tell you that it would be nice to, to proclaim that we are post-racial, that I have nothing to worry about, and I am mostly safe, and you know everyone will treat me equally. But I want to tell you, when you do stuff like that, you tell me what's in your heart. And my love language is acts of service. So your act of service is kind of telling. I want to tell you that I forgive you. I don't know why, but I do. Maybe on behalf of the students that I hope to serve, if I stay in this profession, I want to not have that thing and other things accumulate and derail me, and then that's another one of us lost to this foolishness. So I just move on because my focus is not that. I don't want that to derail from the energy I need to focus on the people that need the energy I have. I want to tell you that you, you need the support of people in your life. That you need to have friends. You need to have uh, colleagues and soulmates with whom you could you know, share that experience and share, share that struggle and, and, and talk about history and compare notes, you know. One interesting journey I, I, I read a lot about, you know, the Ashkenazi Jews who came from the Russian Poland region. And I, I, we talk about this in my class because we bring up things like Tay Sachs and you know, the genetics of that. And, and some of them end up in these really interesting stories. Like, you know, for example, this particular family, surname was Eisenstein, which in the 1900s, the early 1900s, it probably wasn't a good idea to have a name that was too German and too Jewish. So they actually changed their family name to Eldon. And they, they 
grew up kind of in the Chicago area, some moved out to LA, some to New York. And eventually one of them made their way to the University of Michigan. I want to tell you if you're nice to your friends, they might marry you. <laughs> I want to tell you, my dear sons, that I'm sharing you sharing this story with you, not as one of sadness or joy or struggles to define the entire thing. I'm telling you that the world that you are born into and that I'm trying to raise you into is more beautiful than the one I was in and the one my father was in. But it's more beautiful because we are attentive to the things that we need to work on. That to be born into that democracy, to be part of that social contract is an obligation to commit elements of your life, if not all of it, to improving the common good. I want to tell you that you will be as much a scientist as anybody else. And, and you'll have some stories, not the same ones I had, right? But hopefully, you'll have more successes than the dark stuff. And I'll provide you as much support as I can. But if, if those times come, when you find that you have to struggle, I want to remind you to hold on. To hold on. To keep your hand on that plow and hold on. Thank you. I think we're going to do a round of questions. And Michelle, will you be able to check to see if there's any on Zoom, please? OK, great. Does anybody have questions for Dr. Dewsbury? Hi, um, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you for that. Um, <coughs> I, I guess, um, feel like in touch with a lot of what you shared um, based on my life experience personally and um, the student experience as well. And I think one of the things that I struggle to reconcile is the work that I'm doing here. Um, I try to support transfer students as they're coming into the college and there's a lot of emphasis on underrepresented students, students of low income backgrounds, um, first generation students. And um, I fall into a couple of, of those categories, at least when I was in school. And I try to reconcile like my work with them, bringing them into this space and wanting to support them, but knowing sometimes that we are bringing them into a space where they might not feel fully supported in every single classroom, in every single office, um, in every single department. Uh, so how, in your work, have you kind of made peace with that? Because I do have <laughs> partners at our community colleges who they're worried about sending their students to, you know, and right. Davis is inclusive. It has offices to support students of different backgrounds. But generally speaking, we can't protect them in every single space. You know, there are a lot of hardworking people here who want to provide safe spaces for them, a lot of faculty members, a lot of staff, um, our administration. But we can't always be there, and these things are, things are going to happen. You know, so how do you make peace with that, and how do you really strengthen those bridges? I am trying to build bridges with our community college partners and letting them know that they're putting their students in good hands when they come to us. But, you know, that's a question that comes up, and myself and my, my counterpart um, in our sister program, she faces the same questions. So in your work, how have you dealt with that? Oof. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a good question. Um, so I, I think I mentioned this yesterday that um, in the last 
two or three years, I've, I've really shifted a lot of my energy away from uh, classroom practice. Not that I don't believe in it, and we still have projects in the classroom, but but more towards questions of systemic change. And and I, I can't emphasize that strongly enough because. Um, as many of you have intimated over the last couple of days when I've talked to you about things like the curriculum redesign and, and other projects that are ongoing, it's, it's very difficult to, to just address one part of the system um, when the solution you want requires like six or seven parts of the system to be fixed at the same time. And Unfortunately, a lot of times our universities aren't designed in a way that allows for that level of comprehensiveness. And so you, you get bogged down into, you know, we need to fix this one class or this one part of the curriculum or this one office, or, you know. And, um, you know, anybody who does organizational change theory would quickly see the flaws in those approaches, right? And um, I, I'm not naive, right? I get why it's challenging. So specific to your question, the, the follow-up question then has to be, what are the spaces on campus that are toxic, right? And, and once those spaces are identified, what's the accountability process that holds those individuals or those spaces accountable for change? I know the answer to some of those questions from the students that I've taught and advised. But then the second half of it, right, um, where professor classroom behavior, the way in which they talk to students, um, you know, some offices that have just not well run, you know, just from the macro to the micro, um, the, the solution sort of lies in the accountability structure. And for some things, I worry that the accountability structure is not robust enough to bring forth the change that is required at the pace we need, right? So this is kind of a, a big example and maybe a, a little bit extreme compared to what you're bringing up, but when I, I look at a lot of the cases with, with professors harassing students, and I'm flabbergasted at the amount of them who went from this university to that university to that university, and you're like, did you not ask? <laughs> Like it would have taken you five minutes, right? But, but the accountability structure is not there, right? Your, your fame and your value and all of that stuff like supersedes all of these other things. So the perhaps maybe more positive way to answer your question is, as you've intimated in what you've said, there are in fact several spaces where there's support, where people will treat you like family, right? There is a retention center. There is leader program. Right? There is evidence. I mean, there are, there's a lot. So if you are a student at a very large campus, e essentially what you end up wanting to do is to make it a micro campus. Right? You want to identify the three or four places, right? other than, I, I suppose, the classroom. Well, you want the classroom to be inclusive too. But in your general kind of social engagement, you want those three or four spaces that you spend most of your time in so to be a place where you feel like home. Right? So all of you all who advise students in some capacity, you know exactly what I'm talking about, right? Because you know that one student who comes even though they didn't have an appointment and stays for like the whole morning. That's, that's, that comes from that. They've identified you and your space as that space. Now, in a perfect world, on a perfect campus, every space would have that feel. I'm not saying every space would be like your home space, right? But you wouldn't have to kind of pick and choose and say, well, yeah, you could go to Res Life, but don't go to that office, or don't go talk to that person, or skip that class. And that's where you kind of get back to, as you do things like curriculum redesign, if, if inclusive teaching is going to be sort of part of that conversation, like how those classes are taught and structured, that's an opportunity to now make those spaces, I dare say, less toxic or less exclusive. So, uh, you know, your question is a complex one, but it's a good one. So, kind of in summary, it's really kind of that system component, but, but in the absence of that, at least, identifying the spaces that are actually working. So, thank you so much. Yeah. We have one question from the Zoom audience from Ellen Osborne. Mm -hmm. Ellen asks, 
like how a professor taking a personal interest in you in undergrad, mm -hmm. what sources of support did you find the most effective in grad school? <laughs> um, primarily because I will, I will name two things. Um, Primarily because I had, you know, decided to switch to a science education career. I, I got tremendous, tremendous support from our Center for Teaching Excellence, right? So the, the Marco Molinaro equivalent, essentially. And um, I mean, I, honestly, I think if it wasn't for them and the interest they took in, in me from a scholarship perspective, like, none of this stuff would happen, right? I will also say, though, um, that I had a committee of five people, a PhD committee. And one of them always stood out to me because she was one of the only ones who was not just interested in my scholarship, but how I was doing. Like, she, was, she would literally be the only person to say, how are you doing? <laughs> Right, like everybody would say, "How's that chapter coming? Where's the date?" Like she was the only person who used those exact words, and she she was good at messaging to her grad students and to you know like advisees like myself that that your whole person mattered, your mental health mattered, your physical health mattered, and she was a rarity in in that department. Right, the, the messages were different from everybody else. Um, and especially after the mentor I had an undergrad, I really appreciated that because it was clear how much more rare it was at that level. So those two people were really instrumental. The other quick thing I will say is I, 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 did, I had grad school friends, the good people in grad school, but I realized I had to have a life outside of grad school, like things that didn't involve the grad students that I saw when I went on campus to create a little bit of a separation <laughs> of my lab life to my like life life. So, you know, I, I did a lot of athletic things like beach volleyball and, and soccer tournaments and stuff like that and salsa dancing is Miami, right? So, um, and, and that was that, like that crew of people were my own people. And that was a break, that was a necessary disconnect, <laughs> untethering, if I may, um, from that, right? So that was a, a personal decision, and, and it, was, it was great. <laughs> it looks like you have all the questions when it's really Zoom, but it looks like you are just asking a ton of questions. <laughs> so this is more of a comment, actually, <laughs> from the Vice Chancellor of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, mm -hmm. Renata Tall. She just really appreciated and enjoyed your talk. Thank you. Tell I said thank you. So you typed that in the chat, he said. <laughs> thank you for that, Brian. Um, I wanted to hear what your thoughts are about regarding systemic change and organizational change when it comes to graduate training mm -hmm. to change the value of teaching uh -huh. in our graduate training. Like, what, what do you see as a prominent challenge to to that? Yeah, well, um, the, the first prominent challenge is culture, right? Uh, a culture that, uh, you know, when it comes to teaching and science education, that, that this is something worth investing resources in and time in to actually train somebody, God forbid, before they actually step into a classroom. Um, so that a mindset change is required. And um, if and when that mindset change occurs, then it's a matter of how do you structure it, right? So. You know, when you get onto the logistics of it, I'm just picking a number here. If you're doing like a, a five, six chapter dissertation, are you okay with that being seen four chapters instead of six with some time allowed to really meaningfully pursue a teaching certificate, right? That's, that's valuable where you not only doing a teaching portfolio, you're observing classrooms, but you might actually be an instructor on record for a section where you get observed and able to reflect on that. Um, take actual four credit classes in course design um, a really sort of robust model. Um, I, I will say, though, that I, I'm seeing some encouraging signs. I mean, I met a couple of students from the FUSE program here. Um, and I, I, I confess, it was exciting to hear them talk about the experiences with, with Marina and, and the classes they're taking. 
Um, and there's a couple others around the country that's preparing future faculty. I think it's at University of Washington, um, Biotap in Tennessee. We have one at FIU that needs a little bit you know, revamping, but it's, it's, it's not bad. So, so I think it's slowly getting there, right? And um, you know, I, I would love to just wake up tomorrow and just see every graduate degree granting institution have a preparing future faculty type thing. But in reality, I know it's going to be incremental. So I, I, would, I would take Fuse as a small victory, and I really hope it becomes a pretty prominent thing here. The Zoom room is really active. Somebody cut his mic. <laughs> There's actually a question. <laughs> so Hannah Nelson asks, if you had to recommend one book about teaching, what would it be? I know you mentioned Teaching Naked at today's lunch, but were but wondering if there were others. Oh boy, there's a, there's a ton. Um, just one? <laughs> um, I'm torn between two of my favorites. Oh, go for it. Yeah, I'm going to go for it. I just can't. Because they, they, they kind of get at different things. Um, all right, fine. I'll just do three. But I'll stop at three. I promise you, I'll stop at three. One is Amateur Hour by Jonathan Zimmerman. I love that one because it basically chronicles the history of college teaching in the US. Um, and it's, it's, it's a really, really well, you know, um, well done chronology. And it kind of explains why we're in the situation we're in, in ways that you probably hadn't thought about. And it connects to like normal schools, et cetera. Number two is Becoming a critical, Critically Reflective Teacher by Stephen Brookfield. Um, you know, he's, I think he's at St. Thomas University in, I don't know, maybe that, I can't remember. But, but I, I love that because it's, it's, he kind of really embeds himself in his own practice and as a white male talking about anti-racism. Like he really kind of, he puts himself out there, but in ways that are really informative. Um, and then the third one, you know, oldie but good, goody, uh, Teaching to Transgress by the Deceased Bell Hooks. Um, and it's, you know, it's a short read, I want to say six, maybe seven chapters, but you, know, you get into the soul of teaching, um, and the, but the soul of teaching in a time of protest and civil rights and things like that, um, it's, it's a really good one. Um, if you press me, I'll get to Carter G. Woodson and stuff like that, right? But, but I'll, I'll leave it there for now, since I already disobeyed the assignment. <laughs> I am working on, we've talked about it, I'm working on building a community within mm -hmm. our college for some of our underrepresented students and students who often encounter academic difficulty. And I really want it to be a safe space within mm -hmm. the college. Like Alyssa said, you know, there's a lot, a lot of great retention initiatives on campus and places that students can go. Mm -hmm. But since their home is CBS and they have to spend so much time with us getting advising and going to class and going to lab and doing their research, mm -hmm. I also want them to feel like there's a landing pad within our college. Mm -hmm. But I want it to be something that incorporates faculty engagement mm -hmm. with advisors and students as like a collaborative partnership. I just want to know if you have any thoughts on how to engage our faculty, our faculty advisors, and in that, in that type of relationship with students in that type of programming. Yeah. Um, so th there are a couple models that I experienced at URI um, each had its pros and cons, um, more, more pros and cons, to be fair. Um, and, and one thing I would encourage you to, to think about, I'm sure you will, is the logistics of that piece. Because once you start bringing in faculty and staff, now you get into this notion of their time, right? And, and you know, is that time being compensated? And is it kind of above and beyond the current 40 hours and all of these things? And, and you know, you hate to think of student support in terms of those metrics, but is the reality of people who have full employment, right? So, so if, if you had that model where you're having all these stakeholders present, like where and when is that engagement going to happen and, and how is it going to either complement or dovetail with their current set of responsibilities, right? Um, 
One model we had at URI was learning communities where the students would be, get dorm assignments based on, well, learning communities, right? And, and it, so in Res Life, it was something I'd done you know, uh, in collaboration with Res Life. They would have you know, weekly programming, and the faculty and staff would show up to the dorms um, um, for like ice cream socials, which was um, exclusive to the lactose intolerant. Um, but <laughs> but you would you know you would have kind of light programming, difficult dialogues, things like that. Um, I, I think the, the, one of the issues with that model was it didn't for me didn't have a strong enough academic component. Um, so, so maybe to kind of our conversation earlier, case and you know. I'm all for promoting social belonging, but somebody needs to make sure that there was that academic support as well. The second model, and I can connect with my, my close friend of mine who started this program, is called Seed of, Seeds of Success. And it was, what was beautiful about that was it was student run and student led. So she, she created it in collaboration with a student. They get their funding from the college, right? But the students take ownership of it. And I think what I particularly like about it is they don't call it like a minority serving organization. It's not like an affinity group based on ethnicity. It's, they, they market this as a safe space, a supportive space, a community of scholars, right? So you, those little language changes actually goes a long way to not demarcate who gets to be in. And so all their programming is, you know, um, study jam sessions, um, uh, uh, career panels, right? So that's where they invite faculty and staff to come and talk about applying for internships and things like that. Um, then they would also come to some of the intro bio classes and talk about the programming. So the, the two different models sort of depends on who's in charge. You know, is, does there need to be some adult oversight? Yes, right? But I'm actually really impressed with how she set it up in a way that it was minimal. Right? You'll be surprised how students are able to kind of rise to the challenge of being in a leadership and being organized. And oh, by the way, that's also a learning opportunity for them to do that. Um, so, so to the extent you could kind of set it up, you know, create that kind of atmosphere you want, but be able to just sort of step back and observe from the side and, and pick in, that's the, that's the model I kind of like the most. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions? Zoom? Okay. You sure? <laughs> Going once, <laughs> going twice. Okay. Well, thank you all. Um, just before you, sorry, before you um, clap. So um, <laughs> it was quite a whirlwind, <laughs> forty-eight hours, um, and you know this this time here, you know, reminds me why I love to do this in person. I think I said that yesterday, but it bears repeating. Um, and the, the the just graciousness and openness and trust a few people displayed, you know, having just met me 48 hours ago has been, uh, you know, quite heartwarming. And I wanna, I actually wanna leave you with a positive note because I, as you know, I do this a lot, right? I go to a lot of campuses. I can promise you, you are way ahead on a lot of things. And, and it's, while I know being way steep in, in really annoying things like the curriculum reform and some of the retention issues and gaps. Do remember, take pride in some of the things that, that seem to be working, like leader, like, like the teaching center, like, like Marco's data. I mean, it, I was talking to him yesterday and I was saying it's, it's, it's interesting watching as an observer. I feel like I'm seeing the pieces for a beautiful product to emerge, but the, the, that last step of political will to put it all together into a cohesive thing, you know, it's just, it, It'll come, right? But it hasn't come yet. But you, you are much further along than you think. And, and be OK with that. Keep pushing. Keep speaking truth to power. But it's getting better. Thank you so much.